so today we're talking about reimagining leadership. We're doing this reimagining series. How many of you guys have enjoyed it so far? Yeah, it's been a good series. We're going to continue it through the end of this year. Pastor Dean has got some great ideas. I'm really looking forward to it. But today we're talking about leadership. And when I think about leadership, I realize that one of my greatest leadership tasks is raising my three children. Some of you have heard me talk about them before. I love them so much. Um, they are four, seven, and nine. Um, and so that is my greatest leadership task. Sometimes I do it good and sometimes not. Okay, that's the reality. How many parents do we have out here? Okay, I'm just going to be real with you, right? And sometimes um, when you're a leader, what, what really brings out your ability is when the pressure starts to come, right? And in parenting, there are ebbs and flows of pressure. And so a couple months ago, or about a month ago, someone had gifted me, a really close uh, a family member, a trip on a cruise for my graduation. Yeah, it was awesome. So it came at the right time because that pressure cooker of parenting was really starting to, you know, come around, right? And I, and I love my kids, but I'm just saying, like, I don't always have to like them. So this was, like, one of those moments where um, I, just, I just kept saying, I love you. I love you and I love you, but I feel like I need a break. And so there was a lot of a mom guilt in there and all kinds of stuff, but I went on the cruise, and it was in the Caribbean. I've never been to the Caribbean before. It was absolutely amazing. I didn't know there could be warm water. It was crazy warm ocean water. But anyway, in between swimming with the sharks and eating all the cruise food, which is a real thing, um, and, and all that kind of stuff, I read four books on parenting because that's what I do. I overachieve. And so I'm like, I'm going to own this parenting thing. All right? I'm going to get relaxed. I am going to get learned, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to lead my kids the best way possible. So I got my four books, read, and uh, did the cruise, came back so ready on my plane ride. I was like, oh, I can't wait to see my family, my three precious kids. I really meant it. And it was just such a good, you know, I was excited to see them, right? And so, oh, I had, I had learned all the things. Okay, four books, and some of them disagree, but I was going to use them all, Okay. So um, we, I get home, and they greet me, and they're just, they're just awesome. First of all, they are awesome human beings. I really believe that. I, trust me. And so they're just like, oh, I'm so excited to see you. Awesome. We get in the truck. Uh, you know, let's go to Black Bear. That's our, one of our favorite family restaurants. Awesome. Normally, taking three kids is not like my ideal of fun, but I'm like, no, we're going to do this because I am owning leading kids, all right? So we get to uh, Black Bear, and they're just so good, and, you know, everything's going great, and um, I'm thinking, this is awesome. I'm ready to do this, and so, uh, you know, uh, one is like, you know, we're not wanting to eat, and I'm like, you know what? That's okay. I'll give you options. You can have this, or you can have that. We're going to do this together, or one is like, you know, back-talking me, and I'm like, you know what? I love you, and I respect you. Even though you're talking to me like that, I'm still going to respect you because I believe that you're going to respect me. And then, you know, we get home, and there's the brushing of the teeth and the gnarling and all this kind of stuff, and I'm just like, God bless you. I pray for you. We're fine. Jesus loves you, and I love you, and you just need a hug, and I'm going to hug you through this. And then the next morning, as some of my kids normally do, I'm laying there, and it's 6.30, bam, one's right there. Oh, come here and give me a big hug. I just love you. And so, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm owning this thing. And then, you know, the days go by, right? And the pressure starts to cook, you know? And so they start to really do things. And I just, I'm like, okay, the book didn't talk about that. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what to do at this point, you know? So I just keep like, okay, I really didn't like that, what you just did, but um, we're going to work this out. And so what would you like to do? Let's come up with this solution. You know, and by day three or four, I'm back to like, you're going to do what I told you to do because I need you to do it right now. I need to go back on that cruise. Get me there ASAP. <laughs> so that is leadership, right? Like you get your, everybody can be a leader. Listen, being a leader is not hard. And when in my um, leadership degree, we learned all kinds of definitions about leaders. Big, long ones, scholarly ones, simple ones, easy ones, all that kind of stuff. But the basic definition of a leader is someone whose influence moves people from point A to point B. Okay? So bad leaders can do that. It's not hard to be a leader. What is difficult is to be a good leader. That takes a lot of work. And so today, when we reimagine leadership, I want to take you through a journey of how do we become healthy leaders 
who shared the gospel at the same time. And I got to agree, even though um, I have been a leader since high school, professionally, since uh, my young adult years, I have a postgraduate degree in leadership. I agree with what Pastor Dean talked about last week. He, we talked about discipleship, and he said that the church um, focuses way too much on leadership. I 100% agree with that. In fact, I had a, a good friend a long time ago that was one of my pastors, and he left the ministry to be a firefighter. And he mentioned to me at the time, you know, it's amazing how people will come to me and say, are you still a Christian? We have equated leadership with Christianity. And see, what's happened in the process is that we have mistaken ability for anointing and authenticity for holiness. And what we've done is take people that look like they got the goods, or maybe they have the heritage, or maybe they look like they got all what it takes and they've done the right things and said the right things and dressed the right way. And we've said, you know what, let's fast pass you. We're going to put you in a leadership position. And we haven't let them soak in discipleship. We haven't let them learn all the lessons that we need them to learn. In fact, we've just kind of thrown them out there. And then we're surprised when people are hurt by leaders, when they've left the church disillusioned by the things that leaders have done to them, when those leaders probably should have never been in that position in the first place. What we need is leaders that know what who God is that have, like I said, soaked in his word. We need leaders like what it talks about in Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3. It says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Great. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Yes, that's what we want. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in everything they do. So discipled leaders are consistently following God, and you will see their fruit always. Now, on the flip side, there are some of you who are sitting here perfectly fine being discipled. In fact, you're like, I get my worship on, I get my tithe on, I read the Bible, I pray all the time, every day. I am good being discipled. I'm going to leave the leading to everybody else. You are comfortable where you're at. And I want to ask you, are you mistaking your comfort for hurt? or for disappointment, or for fear. See, because what God wants you to do is to be in an uncomfortable position so that he can then do his work through you. And so the best, the most humble question for you to ask is, God, where, what can I do that you can work your best through me? And sometimes that's taking the next step beyond discipleship. And that's what we're talking about today is leadership. So when we reimagine leadership, what does that look like? Well, luckily, Jesus lays out a model pretty well for us. Thank you, Jesus. He does so good at that. Um, And so both by what he does and what he says throughout his life, but there is this pivotal moment. It's that pressure cooker moment. I just got an Instapot. How many of you guys have the Instapot? So you know, like, yes, okay, it's like this pressure cooker, and it's, the steam comes out, and you know that things are, like, really getting cooked in there. And so it's like that moment I talked about. And, and so Jesus is in this really pressure moment. It's the Last Supper. He knows that he is about to walk into the very hardest thing that's ever happened in his life. And he's spending his last moments with his disciples. And it's here where Jesus decides to leave his leadership model. So let's go to Luke 22, 24 through 30. It says, Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Jesus told them, In this world the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. But who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. You have stayed with me in my time of trial, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Before we begin, I want to talk about two things that set the foundation for this whole reimagining leadership. Number one, Jesus is laying out his leadership model. Now, again, in my studies, I learned all kinds of different leadership styles. Um, some that are, have been used a long time ago, some that are current, some fancy, all that kind of stuff. 
And so, but one, the one that is biblical is the one that Jesus just laid out, and that's servant leadership, okay? Jesus very plainly here says, this is my model of servant, of leadership, and that is servant leadership. Now, it, this could be a message all on its own, right, servant leadership, but I think we've learned a lot about this, and so I don't want to spend too much time, but just know that Jesus is saying to his disciples, look, I'm not going to be here much longer, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to be a servant leader. And then the next thing is that Jesus is conferring, he's willing the kingdom that has been given to him. I like how the uh, message versions, version says it and says, now I confer to, on you the royal authority my father conferred on me so you can eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and be strengthened as you take up the responsibilities among the congregation of God's people. So the disciples sat with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They had asked Jesus questions. They had done the hard work. He asked them questions. They struggled together. They lived together. They worked together. They did all these things together. And Jesus is saying, look, I have this kingdom that's been given to me, and now it's time for me to give it to you. And this isn't just for the disciples. This isn't just a New Testament story. But it's the same thing for us. We are those disciples, and Jesus has conferred, he has willed his kingdom to us. And so when we talk about kingdom leadership, it's what we are as leaders in this kingdom, doing with what, what God wants us to do with what he has given Jesus. Even though he knows all our stuff, and I'll get to more of that later. So when we reimagine leadership, there are three key things that we need to do. Number one is that kingdom leaders see the unseen. And if you go to verse 31, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded for you in prayer, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. Isn't it funny when you know the rest of the story and you're just like, oh, Peter, Oh, Peter. Um, and, uh, but Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you to preach the good news and you did not have money, a traveler's bag or an extra pair of sandals, did you need anything? No, they replied. But now he said, take your money and a traveler's bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. For the time has come for the prophecy to be about me to be fulfilled. He was counted among rebels. Yes, everything written about me by the prophets will come true. Look, Lord, they replied, we have two swords among us. That's enough, he said. Let me stop real quick here and um, mention that when it says that's enough, some people have interpreted that Jesus is saying, oh, yeah, that's enough swords. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. But um, actually, a couple different versions, the other way to say it is that they said we have two swords, and Jesus is like, that is enough of the sword talk. You don't get what I'm talking about. Okay, that is not what I mean. But first, when his leaders see the unseen, they see the potential in others. Uh, when, I, when I go on planes, I love to sit in the window aisle. That's my preferred seat. So I get real mad when there's no windows. No, I'm just kidding. But I do love the window seat uh, because I love to watch as you're going up the, um, the, the ground. I, I love to see the layout and how it's like all of a sudden you see all the different lots of land and I love like trying to find where I live or if I'm going into a city that I'm really familiar with, like trying to figure out where the different places are. It's just one of my favorite things to do on a plane. And when I was a couple weeks ago flying into Denver, um, which I'm very familiar with, we were coming down and, and one of the things I really enjoy too is like, you know how things like look like ants, right? When you're kind of high and then you get lower and lower and you start to realize, oh, that's that and you kind of see it. So as we were flying in, there's a vast expanse of land. Denver is, as many of you know, there's mountains on one side and just straight plains on the other. So it goes for days, all the land. And so what I, what I could see is that there's tumbleweeds just tumbling over these um, huge fields. And it looks, from my view, like this land is barren. Like there is nothing that this land will ever be used for. And now all it is is just a place for tumbleweeds to gain uh, ground and get bigger and bigger and travel probably, you know, who knows how far they're going to go. But kingdom leaders see the unseen. And so what I know about that land is very likely it is going to be used for some real estate because it's close to the airport. 
Or maybe it's used for some kind of crop. Because I know the lay of the land and how it's used, I know that that land is not barren. And this is what Jesus does. Even though he deals with these disciples in some really um, ways that you're just like, you're dumb, the disciples. Like, how don't you not get this? You know, Peter, like, get it together. Jesus is telling you, I'm praying for you. You're going to do this. And then you still think you're not going to do it, right? And so Jesus, even though he's dealing with all these people and, and people do things uh, to go against them, Peter, he sure did. He walked out and he denied Jesus three times. Yet Christ, knowing he would do that, still said to Peter, you're my disciple. Pray for yourself. And Jesus, having been denied three times, later on says to Peter, this is one of my favorite um, verses in the Bible. It says in Matthew 16, 18, it says, he's, Jesus is talking to Peter and it says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Even though you denied me three times, you said, I don't know who Jesus is. You thought that you, you could get away with never knowing me. Peter, that hurt like nothing else, but I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing that will conquer what I'm about to do in your life. Now, Peter didn't just exist in the New Testament. There are Peters all over this place. There are Peters in this room. There are people that don't dress like we think they should dress. There are people that have said some really awkward things about some, around some really important people. There are people in this room that we look at them and we think, oh, man, I just don't know if they could ever do all the things God has for them to do. Maybe there are some people in this room that go smoke cigarettes outside, and we think to ourselves, if they don't ever stop doing that, they, God can never use them. Maybe there are some people that don't dress right or don't have the heritage or don't do things how we think that they should be done. And we in our own nature say, mm, I just don't know. Oh, God forbid. Because what Jesus did is said to those people, I don't care what you have done. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what everybody else has said about you. Because what I have planned for you Satan can never conquer it. This is the church I will build. Kingdom leaders see the unseen. And then also, uh, they see the potential in themselves. They, or, I'm sorry, they see the potential in others, and then they see the potential in themselves. Now, this is kind of a tricky thing, because whenever I think about um, Jesus being fully man, fully divine, I always kind of go back to like, yeah, well, Jesus still knew all that he could do, right? So it's easy for him. But remember, he was still fully man. So when he is coming to this point, this pressure cooking point, and he knows what he's going to have to do, there is still that human nature which says, wow, I see what I'm going to do and why I have to do it, but can I do this? This is way too much. And we can sit in a minute, we're going to um, read over Jesus' prayer. So we know that he was tormented by this task. And there are a lot of us kingdom leaders that still struggle with things that people have said to us. Maybe we are not wanting to lead because we can't imagine ever doing anything different than we've always done. Or maybe um, we've been hurt by leadership or maybe we have lots of fear that we deal with. Maybe we prefer to serve others and leave ourselves out of the spotlight. Or maybe you've been told that servant leadership is to put yourself in a lower status so that you can serve others. But that's not true. You are never a lower status than the people you lead. We are all God's people. That's not servant leadership. In fact, you are just as much of a masterpiece than the people that you, that you are leading. And it says in Psalms 139, um, let me get to it real quick here. Uh, Psalms 139, 13 through 14, it says, um, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Oh, how well I know it. Kingdom leaders see the potential in themselves. Not only do they see the potential, but they thank God 
for what he has created. Now, it's very weird to thank God for your own self, but he's saying it right here. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. A lot of us deal with the self-doubt, but I'm going to tell you the trick to get rid of that self-doubt is to start giving um, thanks to the God that created you is start to praise him for how he has made you. And when you start to praise God for how wonderful he has made you, all of that self-doubt, all of the things that have changed you off, that have changed you, will start to fall off. Because God is doing a good work inside of you. He sees something that you can't see, but he needs you to come alongside of him and see the potential in yourself. And then um, the third thing is, Kingdom leaders see the unseen. They see beyond the natural. If you look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning, to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey God. Christ. This goes back to when the disciples are saying to Jesus, oh, hey, I, we have two swords. Is that enough? And Jesus says, yeah, that's enough. No, he's saying, no, that's enough. You're not getting what I'm talking about. See, what you think are weapons are not weapons at all. I have a weapon that is greater than anything you could ever gather. And that is the, the, the weapons of prayer, the weapons of worship, fasting, knowing the word, and fellowship. Because here is the reality. There is an enemy that wants to separate you from the love of Christ. He does not want you to come to know your Savior. He wants, you to, he wants to come after you. And so there is a supernatural world out there. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like when you have bad chicken and the devil's in your chicken, okay? Or when, like, you get a parking ticket and the devil's in that parking ticket. No, you just did some things that you probably shouldn't have done, all right? I am talking about some greater struggles that you are having in your life, some things that you're seeing that are happening. And this doesn't mean you have to get all weird, okay, like some of us have learned to do. But Jesus lays out some simple tools and can I be completely honest with you? Is that okay? We talked about this in first service. It happens more in first service. One of those tools is, well, the biggest tool is with our mouth. Okay? We fight the enemy with our mouth. Now, we provide a tool for you guys every Sunday, and that is worship. Now, every Sunday, i got to be honest, and I, and, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but uh, especially in the 9 o'clock service, 9 or 11 o'clock, Uh, We start worship. We are ready to battle. We got our weapons out. We are going to praise God because we know that that breaks down the dark principalities. That worship begins to lift up the saints. That there are going to be some things happen inside all of us during that time. But what is such a bummer to me is that it will be 1110 and half of you are still entering the building. Now, I don't want you to get mad about what I'm saying. Because what I really want is for you to be encouraged from the front to the back, okay? Can you imagine what this entire church would look like if all of us came in here at 11 o'clock ready to fight our battles together as one, okay? And that don't mean it's just you up in front, okay? I appreciate that all of us up in the front start to battle. But what I would love to see is all of us from front to back with our hands raised Trusting that God is going to do something great in this room at that time. Don't miss that opportunity. Okay, and there's some other ways. Listen, if you don't make it for worship, you can start to pray. It's real simple. Okay, and you don't have to pray for like half hour a day. I learned that as a young Christian, some people wanted to make us pray for an hour a day. And that really messed me up. Listen, God wants to talk to you all day long. He doesn't want to just talk to you for one hour. He wants to talk to you all throughout the day. So you are fighting. You are using your weapons when you start to pray all day long. And then you got an extra hard battle. Well, you better start fasting, okay? And I'm not talking about, you know, you need to, like, fast for 40 days, okay? I'm just saying that maybe at lunchtime you go to your car and you skip a meal. We're Americans. Most likely we can skip one meal, okay? 
Just saying, also with Thanksgiving, you buy some extra stuff. It's like, it's like twofold. Like, you know, skip a meal, pray, and then also, you know, use up those calories that you might have gotten too extra. Anyway, uh, maybe that's just me. Is that just me? Nobody had extra pie? Or a whole pie? No? Okay. <laughs> but maybe you're going through an extra hard time. Fast during lunch. One day, one meal, get your weapons on, get your war on in the supernatural. Fellowship, that's another way of, of, of fighting. When you are in fellowship with other believers, they will come alongside you and lift you up. So kingdom leaders do not lack these things. In fact, they lean into these things. They are ready. They're ready for worship. They're ready for prayer. They're ready for fasting. They know the word, and they're ready for fellowship. A kingdom leader does this even when they don't want to. Because some days you just don't want to, right? Some days I just don't want to. Um, but kingdom leaders will do it even though they don't want to. Okay, so number two. So the first one is that kingdom leaders see the unseen. And number two is that kingdom leaders know how to do hard things. Now, there's that saying, like, we do hard things, do hard things. Now, I, I've always had a little problem with that because I think a lot of us do hard things. We do really hard things. How many of you do hard things in this house? A lot of hard things. Wow, only like two people raise their hand. You guys need to like do some hard things. Um, but you can do hard things and you can never grow from it. You need to know how to do hard things. And Jesus models to us how to do hard things. And it says in verse 39, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. And then he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. I just talked about this, but prayer is how you do hard things. Jesus was about to do the hardest thing he's ever done, walking into his crucifixion, yet he knew what he had to do. In prayer, it's just simply talking to his father, the king of the universe. Prayer, it's he had to pour out so he could get poured into. Prayer, it's getting his priorities straight and getting ready for the chaos. It's prayer, it's praying for others, those that need strength, those that are going through the same thing. Prayer, it's nothing pretty, it's nothing scripted, it's just honest conversation about ability, about worry, about sadness, and all the questions that you might have. Prayer, it's the weapon that gets us ready for battle. Prayer, it's the unifying factor of God's army. Prayer, it's an unexplainable mystery that provides miracles for even the worst situations. Prayer, it's the first thing and the last thing that we should do. In prayer, it's what kingdom leaders do to become stronger leaders. I love this moment of prayer with Jesus in the garden. Because sometimes we think about religious leaders like pious and reform, refined, dressed well. And when they go to pray, we imagine them on their knees doing the right thing. But that was not Jesus. He was dismayed. And he got to the garden, and he sweat like drops of blood. The garden of Gethsemane or the, the olives, it also um, can mean the, pre the, the pressing of olives. It's that pressure cooker. It's where Jesus was. In that pressure moment, he went to the place where olives are pressed, okay? And he poured out to his father, help me because I can't do this myself. So how do we do th hard things? We pray. And then next, we know that our confidence comes from our inadequacy because our Father will fill in the rest. A couple, a lot of years ago, um, about 20 years ago, um, uh, I was only 10, um, I went to Romania. <laughs> I went on a missions trip to Romania. It was my very first missions trip, and it happened to be the hottest, like it was the uh, worst heat wave in Europe that they had seen in decades. Okay, so a lot of our ministry had gotten changed around, and it, and it was like in the hundreds. It, we had 
And, you know, it's not like there's air conditioning everywhere or ice. Why in Europe don't you have ice? But there was just not a lot of things that, you know, we were just hot and it was tired. And like I said, it was my first mission trip and I was leading it. So this was all a lot of complexity. And so the very last day, we were on the bus ready to go home. We were minutes from getting on the plane to go to America. And I just really wanted an American hamburger, I'm just saying. So I was like really looking forward to that. And the gypsies in Romania are, are looked like at tr- as trash. They are the lowest of the lowest. Even when I went, the Christians in Romania looked down upon the gypsies. That's how low they were looked upon. And so um, we were on, I was on the bus, and our bus driver was standing outside, and there was a gypsy boy, probably about nine years old, and he was just uh, being a boy, just doing kind of crazy. He was begging, but he was kind of playing around. I think he was kicking a soccer ball or something like that. And our bus driver got so irritated at him. He got so mad. He kept telling him, like, you need to, you know, shut up or, you know, whatever. And I could see that this situation was escalating, but I really did not want to get off the bus. I was so tired. And so I was watching this exchange, and I kind of felt like, like, maybe I should get up. Like, this isn't right, you know. And so all of a sudden, this bus driver just had enough, and he picked the boy up like a piece of trash from his ankles and flipped him upside down, and boom, 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 just like that. I'll never forget it. And I knew I should get off the bus to minister to this boy. But I sat there, and I let two other ladies that were way better leaders than I was They got off the bus, and they went and rushed to this boy. It is still to this day one of my biggest regrets. But I will not let it define my kingdom leadership. Because in my darkest, worst, lack moments, those are the moments when Jesus will come in and do his work. And how many of you know that his work is better than my work could ever be? Amen? And on the other side, you have leaders who think they know it all, that think they have no inadequacy. That's how you have leaders like Stalin and Hitler and uh, some political leaders that think they, um, that all they do is want power, power. Saddam Hussein, commanders of brutal armies. These are leaders that think that they have no inadequacy. But what they have missed is that when you think you are the best, your limit is your own humanity. Okay, but when you know that your source is a limitless, perfect God, there is no ceiling on what you can do. So in this room, you have may have messed up, and you can't imagine how you will ever do a hard thing again, and that is the perfect place to be. Because God is about to do some awesome stuff through your inadequacy. And then finally, their strength is from doing the will of God. And there at the last moments, Jesus is saying, let your will be done, not mine. And the angels strengthened him. Okay, here's the thing. Um, How many of you have been 20-something once? Okay. Um, So if you, you know, so don't judge the 20-somethings that are actually 20-somethings right now. But I'm just saying, um, almost every 20-something asks this question. What am I supposed to do with my life? What is the will of God? And maybe you're still asking. That's okay. What is the will of God? I don't know if I should go here or have this job or do this or I just don't know. And then they get, you know, stuck by their own, you know, doubt and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just saying that when I'm talking, whenever I talk to these people about the will of God, I always say to them, the will of God is not that job that you're questioning. The will of God is not that, that person that you're deciding if you should go on a, a date with. Um, The will of God is not whether or not you should get a red or blue car, okay? The will of God is not whether or not you should go to college or not. The will of God is that you follow him in everything that you do, that you seek his kingdom first. And it says in Matthew, if you seek his kingdom first, all these things will be added onto you. So let's get it straight. The will of God is to seek him. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing in the garden, He didn't ask, wait a second, um, what am I supposed to do next? What's my next step that I should take after this? But he said, God, Father, your will, not mine. I trust you. I know you're going to do something great. So our strength is from doing the will of God. And listen, when you know that the will of God is to follow him, 
all those other questions, like, I mean, they are hard, right? I mean, and you should, you should ask, double check, like, who you're going to marry. I'm just saying, like, don't just marry anybody just because, you know, be sensible. God gave us common sense. But I'm just saying, like, um, when you are questioning and you are struggling with, whoa, what should I do here? When you put your mind that the will of God is that I follow him, that I seek his kingdom, I'm telling you, whatever decision you make, even if it's wrong, God is walking with you through that. So if there's, I feel like actually, that I feel like right now there's somebody in this house that's like questioning what they should do. I'm going to tell you what you should do. You should follow God. Seek his kingdom. It's real simple. Don't make it complicated. Follow him and he will strengthen you. Okay, so number three. So first one is kingdom leaders. See the unseen. Kingdom leaders do hard, know how to do hard things. And then kingdom leaders know their purpose. I kind of talked about this already, but let's go to verse 45. It says, at last he stood up again and returned to the disciples only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you might not give into temptation. But even as Jesus said this, a crowd approached, led by Judas, one of the 12 disciples. Jesus walked over to Judas to greet him with a kiss. And then Jesus said, Judas, would you betray, betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? Now, again, remember, they don't get it. Okay. Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. And one of them struck at the high priest's slaves, at the high priest's slave, slashing off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this, and touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus spoke to the leading priests, the captains of the temple guard, and to the elders who had come from him. Am I some dangerous revolutionary, he asked, that you would come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. Now, there's a couple things happening here. And it's this kingdom leaders know their purpose, and that is to spread the good news. Now, Jesus is spreading a whole lot of good news in this portion. Okay, so let's start with... Um, when the disciples get to get there and they go to cut off the ear and Jesus heals it right away. Now, I kind of equate that moment to a social media. Can we go there for a second? So a lot of times we think that, or, or maybe it's even conversation with, I talked to a friend yesterday and they, they uh, had conversation with somebody on the holidays and we all love our family, right? Like families are the best at every holiday. We just, it's the greatest, Right. And, but there's never any arguments or anything like that. Um, and th- not always the case. So my friend, she was with her family, and, and they got into a huge political argument. And, you know, I've heard this over and over again. The holidays happen to bring out, you know, arguments like that. But today in this world, a lot of us are so concerned with arguing the, the will of God or arguing for God that we miss sharing the love of Christ. Okay. That deserves a round of applause, yes. I see this on Facebook, sadly. Now, I don't get on Facebook a lot. Um, I have a couple reasons. I, I like my privacy. Um, I uh, Also, it's time I don't have and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But uh, whenever I jump on there, I am so sad to see that there are people who may be sitting in this room putting all of their burning passion into arguing something for Jesus that he could do himself. You don't have to help him. But more than that, and I'm not saying you should never make a point, and and I'm not saying you shouldn't be on Facebook. It's none of that. But it's that if you stop for a second, and before you even argued with somebody, social media or not, if you stop for a second and looked that person in the face and said, you know what, I don't agree with you, but before I go any further, can I pray for you? Sincerely, not like, can I pray for you? No, but seriously. I, I don't care about this argument. Can I pray for you? Do you need healing? Do you need the power of Jesus to come into your life? Can I just simply serve you and pray for you? Because I think it's pretty clear what Jesus did. See, his disciples, they got hot. They were like running in there. We're going to take care of this. 
We got our two swords. We are ready to go. These people are wrong, and my Jesus is right, and we are going to let them know. And they slash off the ear of a servant. How even more horrible is that? And Jesus, without even thinking, rushes in and heals the ear in an instant. He it wants wholeness. He wants people to see that I have what you need. That I will take care of any hurt that you have. And oh God, God forbid that I would ever say anything else but that Jesus loves you that he is calling you, that he has a wholeness for you, that he wants you to come into relationship with him. I could care less, literally, what you think about Trump. I really could. Because what I want you to know is that there is a gospel full of good news, and that is the life-changing Trump could change my life all day long in ways I don't or do like. I do not care because at the end of the day, Jesus is my Savior. And here's the thing. Our purpose is not threatened by darkness. Yeah, it's, that's tough. Is that me? Okay, there we go. We're okay, right? Thanks for hanging with me, guys. Um, their purpose is not threatened by darkness. There at the end, he, Jesus says, I love uh, Jesus' comments because they're so, like, um, perfectly pointed, right? He says, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. Now, upon first reading that, you think to yourself, wait a second, Jesus. We would never give people to the powers of darkness. But Jesus is like chiding them. He's like saying, okay, this is your moment. This is the moment that you've been waiting for. You're going to do whatever you're going to do, and you're going to do it. Okay, and Jesus is giving them that hour. But this is what we know, and this is why I love knowing the rest of the story, is even though they think they've done what they could do, even though they got a disciple to come and kiss him and betray him, Jesus still knows the rest of the story. And he knows that their power, their hour of darkness is not going to be forever. In fact, in Psalms 37, 12, and 13, it says, The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance. But the Lord just laughs. For he sees their day of judgment coming. Kingdom leaders know their purpose. They are not deter deterred by anything or anyone coming at them. They do not get stuck by what somebody has said to them. They do not believe all the riffraff going on around them. They do not believe that darkness has reigned in this generation. They do not believe that darkness is set here to stay. They do not believe that any one person cannot come out of the darkness. They do not believe that their destiny is for darkness. Kingdom leaders know that there is a day, that that day is now, that people will come to know Jesus, that they will be healed in Jesus' name, that they can see people healed and saved. That is what a kingdom leader sees. They are not afraid of the darkness. Now here's the thing as I close. This is what I get really excited about, is that the church, so we as the church, we are an army, right? And we're going to do some really awesome things. We have some really incredible visioneers in this place. You guys, we have, I was talking to Pastor Dean the other day. Um, he was asking, you know, uh, before we hear, how do we do certain things? And we looked at this board of 15 areas of ministry. And I am not joking, 13 of those we did not do before Pastor Dean was here. 13 of those areas we have raised up from people in this room. Our visioneers have done it. You guys can give yourself a big round of applause. But I'm going to be honest, this is what we need. We need some kingdom leaders to rise up and to take those areas to the next step. Because here's the thing, a lot of times when we, I read about leadership, I always ask myself, now why shouldn't everybody be like this, right? 
What is the difference? And here's the difference. Yeah, everybody's different. If you're just a disciple in this room or if you're just chilling and don't want to be a leader, I want you still to soak in everything that I said because it's the Bible. But the difference between you and a leader is that it's where I talked about in the beginning. A leader moves somebody from point A to point B. So a kingdom leader is moving people in the direction that I talked about. A kingdom leader is helping others to see the unseen. A kingdom leader is helping others to see that there is something greater inside of them. A kingdom leader is helping others to know how to do hard things. And a kingdom leader is keeping the purpose at the forefront of everybody's mind. And that is to spread Jesus across this land. And I believe that there are people in this room, you have not stepped up yet for whatever reason. I have heard all of them. My dog, whatever. All of them. There are people in this room, you are on the edge. Or you are way far away. You think that you don't know what it takes. Or you think you don't have the energy. And I am saying to you that God is calling you to something greater. And I am asking you to take a step of faith and to walk out what God has for you. Because I see it. I see the unseen in all of you. And I know every person in this room has some great things ahead for them. And that God wants to move you, to move others. We can't just sit here. We must be an army and rise together to do some great things. So I've got a practical thing for you to do. And that is um, if you uh, want to take the next step in leadership, I want you to text 97000. That's our text line. RLC leadership. Now what's going to happen is when you text that number, it's going to automatically put you in a list. Pastor Jamie will be calling you this week. He's going to talk to you about some things, some visions that you may have had, some dreams that you've had. Or maybe you don't even know what you want to do. That's the best place, right? Because we're going to tell you. Um, and so we got some things coming for you. But as I close, I would also ask, maybe you don't want to do that specifically, but you want to do a kingdom of leader. Can we all stand together if that is you? If you want to be a kingdom leader, if you want to see the unseen, if you want to do some great things, if you want to help move people from point A to point B, if you want to use the Holy Spirit inside of, uh, inside of you to influence others, would you stand with me? And I'm going to pray for every last one of you. Jesus, I thank you, God, for the people in this room. God, you have um, done something great, Lord. You are doing something great, Jesus. God, I see people that are going to move mountains, God. I see people in this room that are going to have outreaches that will by far um, pass any outreach we've ever, ever done. God, I see people in this room that are going to lead kids, Lord, your precious children, God. I see people in this room that want to help children come to know you, Jesus. God, I see people that want to call people and share the love, that pray for people. God, I see that you are doing something great. Lord Jesus, that the power of hell will not come against them. In Jesus' name, God, I pray for your Holy Spirit and your anointing to be poured out. God, may ability never become our focus, but may anointing become our reason, God. And I just ask that you would continually fill us over and over again. And I thank you, God. Oh, God. I thank you for every person in this room. Jesus, you have destined them for great things. And even if they're not standing now, God, you have destined them for great things. So I pray that you would bless us, God, as we go forward. We pray all these things in your name. We love you, God. We love you, God.